Hello, everyone. Welcome to lesson number three of this MOOC called Online Educational Tools, What's On? This MOOC is about digital projects for heritage education. I'd like to thank ICOM Portugal, ICOM Italy and Czech Republic for the invitation. My name is Filipa Leit. I have a degree in the history of art and a master's degree in museology from the Porto University. In the last 13 years, I have been working in mediation and education in museums and other cultural institutions. I am the founder of Museiar Story Patrimonio since 2020, where I work for other institutions. I am part of SECA's special interest group, Professional Development of Museum Educators. So, the aim of the HELP project is to guide museums through a self-assessment process and to support them in the realization of digital projects for heritage education based on open licenses. This free online lesson plan will help to improve open access approaches and participatory opportunities. 15 free online lessons for an online training available in English on YouTube. Online educational tools, what's on? By the end of this lesson, you will be able to know which social networks are being used by museums, what kind of activities can be performed by each one, for what age group are these activities, and which social network best suits your museum, that there is a new way for museums to communicate as well, not better, not worse, but different. So, education is one of the main functions of museums, as we all know. And if one day education in museums was understood only for children, today it is taught for all ages and for different audiences. Today, museums think their activities for people with different ages, different interests, and different ways of being. Today, museums take creative risks to shape the future and to inspire people. Web 2.0, particularly social networks, have become another form of contact between audiences and museums and are, for this reason, framed within the museum's mission, communication and education. In this case, the museum must understand the specific scope of each of the networks it has at its disposal, know how they work, the purpose for which they are created, and know the motivations of those who use them. A few years ago, the only purpose of museum communication on social media was to have an official website. And there were times when being on Facebook was considered unserious for museums and did not dignify the institution. But with the arrival of Web 2.0, the official discourse of these institutions has changed. By participating in spaces created by others, museums had to adjust their content to communication models. At first, the presence of museums on social network was limited to being a tool to promote the museum itself and its activities to ultimately bring virtual visitors to the physical museum. But with, with the arrival of Web 2.0 in 2005, the web was transformed into a space for creation, collaboration, and exchange. These tools quickly became successful because they were easy to use and free. Applied to museums, Web 2.0 served to enable visitor participation in three different spaces. First, within the museum's own websites and blogs, Two, in the external repositories where it is possible to share audiovisual materials such as videos on YouTube, Flick, audio on iTunes, presentations on SlideShare. And three, on social networks, Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, Instagram, YouTube, and the recent one, TikTok. However, with so many tools at their disposal, museums need to design their online identity to think about where they want to be, how they want to be, and who they are going to communicate to. Museums can create online activities and dynamics without losing their essence. 
it is truly necessary that the museum behaves according to its own truth. And in this sense, it is no longer rare to see museums that really communicate with their audiences when they question and comment. The way of being online is no longer static, but dynamic and allows an engagement with its publics. Finally, followers feel re recognized by being called to actively participate. Today, besides the importance of collections, exhibitions and conservation, of course, it's also of great importance the bonds, experiences and memories that museums provide to their audiences. Since 2019, due to the pandemic, museums had to close their doors. And more than ever, the web was the best way to receive audiences because they were still serving society, communicating, exhibiting the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity for the purposes of education, study and delight. And we should not forget that the future depends on what we do in the present. So what can museums do to be there for their audiences? To start, they can communicate through their websites. We're going to see some examples right now. So nowadays, almost every institution has a website. That's true. A lot of them are static. They don't put any uh, contents after, uh, after it. Here is an example of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, in the United States of America, on its website under the tab Education, teachers, pandemic teaching, we get to some online educational resources. These are about art activities to support students' emotional wellness, a very interesting subject at this time we are living. Here we have an example to show you of an activity for preschool children, young children. Kandinsky was a musician as well as a painter, sometimes both at the same time. This activity, promotes obser observation, creativity, and inspiration. The museum asks how many different colors can you find? What kind of lines do you see? Choose a line and use your finger like a paintbrush to trace it in the air. Can you find two boats in this painting? Can you find a city or do you so see something else? What color would you use to express different feelings? Happiness, sadness, excitement, anger, and if this painting were a piece of music, what might it sound like to you? Of course, this is a, an activity to be done in family with young children, but of course with their parents. Well, then we're going to know a little bit about Facebook. Well, Facebook is a social network that allows several types of approach. It allows us to just post a text post images and write about, make videos, create events, and so on. This example of Museo delle Scienze in Trento, Italia, well, we can see that museums can post videos like this example. This activity was a multi-voiced intergenerational debate on current events, politics and Europe, the uncertainty of the future, sex and stereotypes, keeping the focus on ideas and focusing on the opinion of young people. It was an online live conference. It could be seen on the museum's Facebook page and on its YouTube channel. Museums can post images and communicate like that. Simple. For example, the Facebook page of the Museo du Louvre uh, does once a week a post about an artwork of the week. This example, we see a post uh, written with some images that represent a work of, of art. This portrait uh, on this shroud fragment is painted on a light colored background. This fragment comes from a funerary shroud intended to envelop uh, the mummy. And like this, we get to know a little bit about this fragment. Educational workshops. 
Museums can also do educational workshops as well in Facebook. The next activity of Fundação Cupertino de Miranda in Portugal took place during Carnival, at a time when Portugal was experiencing a new lockdown. Thinking of the various family generations, the activity is Team Search, challenges families to explore self-esteem and create a physical and psychological self-portrait with colored paper, cardboard, black pen, glue, scissors, and paper tape. <laughs> Influenced by her surreali his surrealist collection, um, families are invited to make their own face. Then they cut and glue it to the cardboard. There they draw things they like. For example, if they like to read, they can draw books. Then glue the card on the back without seeing the self-portray. And finally, the family members must write three psychological qualities on the card. Then the museum hopes people can share the final results with them. Well, I know this video is in Portuguese, but I'd like you to watch just a little bit, it just uh, to see the final result. A Fundação Cupertino Miranda desafia a vossa família a explorar a autoestima através da atividade comemorativa do Carnaval. Busca e estima. A origem do Carnaval é muito antiga, mas desconhecida. No entanto, há quem defenda que o Carnaval chegou a ser uma celebração em que as pessoas se mascaravam para não serem reconhecidas. Assim, sentiam-se à vontade para se comportarem como lhes apetecia antes do período prolongado da abstinência da Quaresma que antecede a Páscoa e sem a preocupação de serem julgados. Vamos trabalhar o autorretrato físico e psicológico para perceberem que motivos por vezes nos levam a esconder-nos. Vão precisar do seguinte material para esta atividade. Folha A4 colorida para cada participante, cartolina A3 colorida para cada participante, marcador preto para cada participante, tesoura, cola líquida ou de batom e fita cola de papel de preferência. Passo 1. Colocar a folha A4 na cara e moldá-la. Desenhar o autorretrato lentamente, tomando consciência de todas as formas e volumes da cara. Testa, well, sobrancelhas, like olhos, this, nariz, we will have a fecha, boca e queixo. Of course, Não conseguimos of controlar esta técnica na totalidade, assim como acontece com as técnicas surrealistas. Pousar a folha e completar o desenho com pormenores como fechar linhas e acrescentar pestanas, pálpebras, narinas, cabelo e orelhas. O pescoço é opcional. Passo 2. Recortar o autorretrato a toda a volta. Colar o autorretrato na cartolina, preferencialmente com a cartolina na vertical, porque a nossa cabeça é mais comprida do que larga. Passo 3. Desenhar o autorretrato psicológico no fundo do vosso trabalho. O autorretrato psicológico reflete características sobre nós próprios. Neste caso, queremos apenas que ilustrem qualidades da vossa personalidade. Como por exemplo, se me considero uma pessoa divertida, posso desenhar muitos sorrisos ou muita gente a rir-se. Se me considero uma pessoa aventureira, desenho as minhas viagens e aventuras. Se me considero estudiosa, desenho-me rodeada de livros. Passo 4. Para concluir, em família devem fazer o seguinte. Colar a cartolina de cada um nas respectivas costas com fita cola papel. O verso tem de estar direcionado para fora. Todos devem escrever três qualidades preferencialmente psicológicas sobre cada participante na respectiva cartolina, como podemos ver nas imagens. Os elementos da família que ainda não souberem escrever podem apenas conversar ou pedir alguém para escrever por si. Prometemos que se vão surpreender, a vocês e à vossa autoestima. Gostaríamos que partilhassem os resultados connosco e refletissem sobre estas questões. Uma qualidade é vista por todos de igual forma? Se tivermos uma autoestima em baixo, como acham que os outros nos verão? Acham que a partir de hoje vão fazer mais elogios? Divirtam-se! Ok, 
Okay. So, through Facebook, you can do some challenges as well. The Museu Bordal Pinheiro in Portugal is responding to a challenge made by the Yorkshire Museum in England. So the Yorkshire Museum is asking museums around the world to share an object of their collections that look like a celebrity. The Museu Bordal Pinheiro has found one, as you can see over here, and then they put another image. They say that almost everyone that looks to this party made in 1890 thinks of Donald Trump. It is an activity that involves other museums as well, and without a doubt, has a sense of humor. Now, let's know a little bit about Instagram. Through Instagram, you can post videos and images. In this case, we're going to watch a little bit of this video. In February, in, this, in its story of the month, the Museum of London presented a video featuring a 1999 silver earring represent, representing the Labris, a double-headed axe, a lesbian feminist symbol associated with strength and self-reliance, related with women, goddesses, and warriors, women. On this video, we can see the LGBTQI heritage curator and educator speaking. Let's watch a little bit about this LGBTQIA video. representation in heritage can often feel like a powerful weapon used to reveal that these identities have always existed via iconic figures, stories and objects from the past. And sometimes that representation, quite literally, is a powerful weapon. Like the silver earring from 1999 from the Museum of London, representing a la Brice, a double-headed X. Now, a person wearing this at the time wouldn't just be thinking, hey, was this I'll be looking sharp. They would want to pass along a specific message, making their identity visible. Because the Larisse is a lesbian feminist symbol, associated with strength and self-reliance and rooted within a history of powerful goddesses and war women. The Larisse first emerged in Minoan civilization during the Bronze Age, on the island of Crete in Greece. It was linked to powerful goddesses who held central importance within Minoan society. Later on, the Labris was sometimes offered to the Greek goddess Artemis. She was the goddess of the moon, of the hunt, and of unmarried girls, since she herself was a virgin who refused to give up her freedom for a man. In Roman Crete, the Labris was also associated with a group of powerful mythological women, the Amazons. These legendary warrior women fought together and lived together away from men and were inspired by real Scythian women with exceptional fighting, riding and hunting skills. Now, records of and direct references to women loving women in history and legends alike are severely lacking. These relationships are often made invisible when they're not openly condemned. However, Artemis's chastity, which was usually defined by lack of relationships with men, no references to lack of relationships with women, as well as the very nature of the Amazons challenging the gender norms of the time, mean that men today can and do look at these figures via an LGBTQIA lens. They have become powerful icons that many can relate to, to explore and express their own gender identity, gender expression, sexuality, and love. In the same way, the Labrice, originally a symbol for powerful women, came to represent the power of all women. In the 70s, New Age pagan practices using ancient matriarchal symbols included the Labrice. It first came to be used as a feminist activist symbol before specifically becoming a lesbian one. In 1999, the same year this earring was made, graphic designer Sean Campbell designed the lesbian feminist flag featuring the Labrice. We don't know which one came first, the flag or this earring, but wearing one or waving the other would send 
this powerful message that you were visible, that you were proud, and that you had a lesbian feminist axe to grind. So, this was an example of the Museum of London. This one from the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, Netherlands. Well, this post is very current and very interesting, especially for football fans and even more specifically for Italian football team supporters. The museum took advantage of the Euro 2020 theme to congratulate the Italian team with a funny tone. They post an image of a painting that represents the Roman Coliseum and they wrote, the, as we did it, uh, hashtag Euro 2020 champions. The party in Rome today is probably bigger than the little get together in front of the Coliseum on this painting. A huge congrats to our Italian friends and a shoulder to cry on for our English mates. We know the feeling lads. This text has a light tone and also uh, a little bit of sense of humor. There is an educational workshop here in the Museo de Arte de São Paulo uh, in Brazil. The art museum had asked its followers to submit drawings inspired by an exhibition. They thank all the participants who submitted their works and are showing us uh, two, three examples. And as we can see, they are very interesting works. This challenge happens uh, every month on Instagram. The Getty Museum, um, in his stories, the Getty Museum launched a challenge to his followers, a little quiz with the correct answers at the end. Uh, that this dynamic involves the followers, allowing them to know a little more about the collection in a relaxed way through their cell phone, computer or tablet. So the quiz is about a lot of different um, works of art, in this case, which writing system was used in ancient Mesopotamia, the cuneiform or hieroglyphs, uh, a painting of Peter Paul Rubens, uh, he is responsible for which term, Ruben sandwich or Rubenesque, and so on here with modern art and about um, uh, Artemisia uh, had a famous father named Horatio or Caravaggio. And of course, the, the answers uh, on the last story. On YouTube, well, on YouTube, we mostly can see uh, videos. The MoMA in New York promotes, uh, among the other things, courses as well. In this case, they are uh, about uh, contemporary art and they are promoting with this, this text and a small video about it. The Natural History Museum uh, in London here. Uh, in this case, we have an example of a museum that publicly demonstrates the important importance of sustainability. It makes the change within itself and reveals it to its followers, also becoming an example for the community. <laughs> they are becoming a greener museum to help create a greener planet. Nature is in a state of emergency and it needs our help more than ever. We must act now together to create a world where both people and the planet thrive. They are asking everyone to do their bit to protect our planet and want to lead the way. Sustainability is already at the heart of the museum. And they have a small... We're becoming a greener museum for oh. a greener planet. Our science shows how human act... I'm sorry? We're becoming a greener museum for a greener planet. Our science shows how human activity is changing nature. So we want to do our bit and reach net zero as fast as we can. We're tackling our greenhouse gas emissions and switching to sustainable technologies. Our energy is already sourced sustainably, so we'll be working to reduce our energy intensity by 40%. We'll be asking our suppliers to join us in working in a way that's kinder to people and planet. This includes our shop, where we'll reduce plastic packaging and create sustainable product ranges. We also want to be responsible about waste. So by 2023, we'll increase our average recycling rate from 47% to at least 
Our staff will only use air travel when necessary and take green transport as much as possible. We'll help to conserve one of Earth's most precious resources by reducing our water consumption by 20%. We also want to make our money work for good. Food in our cafes should only have a small impact on nature, so we'll keep using sustainably sourced produce. New projects in the museum will be more sustainable from the beginning, and all new buildings will be net zero carbon. There are no shortcuts when it comes to reducing our impact on the environment. Join us on our journey to create a greener museum. Well, now, on YouTube we can do as well some educational workshops as we can see here in the Van Gogh Museum has a variety of videos on YouTube, many of them in English, but not in this case for children. There are several videos posted about six months ago that developed their art education, as we can see, inspired by Van Gogh works. There are a lot of them uh, with a small time uh, duration, like three minutes, four minutes, two minutes. They are very pleasant to be seen with children. Now let's talk about a little bit about TikTok. As a platform that inspires creativity and brings joy, TikTok also creates and celebrates culture that trans transcends borders. Over the past year, some of the world's most famous and cultural institutions have joined TikTok and have connected with a wider audience, welcoming visitors digitally through immersive online experiences. Du Fisi Gallery, a museum of Renaissance era art in Florence, Italy, is using TikTok to bring its statues and paintings to life. Du Fisi Gallery, in particular, was initially little known to outsiders of the fine art space, but its TikToks have given its collection a new fan base. Let's watch this small video to understand the museum message. Never mind, I'll find someone like you. Well, it's very little, very short. We met a 99th century statue, Psyche Abandonata, abandoned by Pietro Tenerani, that Uffizi Gallery linked perfectly and dramatically to Adele, someone like you sung. Both stories truly heartbreaking. This TikTok is the most viewed creation on the <laughs> museum's account, having been viewed more than 80,000 times. And thus the gallery managed to show a sculpture to 80,000 people. Still on TikTok, this portrait of Felix Maximo Lopez, composer and first organist of the Royal Chapel in 1820, is the setting of a small presentation of his musical, musical work in the Museo del Prado in Spain, just next to his portrait. Uh, just let me see the sound over here. Okay. Very interesting activity also, don't you think? Well, still on TikTok, the more conservative may have difficulty imagining that a museum founded in 1852 would use its collections in a video with a background music from a hit series on Netflix. That's the example of the Victorian Alberts Museum.
It is also very interesting to see the followers comments on this video as this one. Whoever is running our TikTok is doing a great job. They need a pay raise. I'm loving the creativity and shade. Other online educational activities, games. Museum Craft, British Museum in London is using Minecraft. How museums can provide a learning experience that is exciting, novel, and which also allows the target audience to learn for themselves. For many museums, Minecraft presents a world of opportunities when it comes to providing a point of entry to a particular subject matter for newcomer plus. Minecraft can help to shape learning without ever, ever making use of traditional teaching techniques at all. I'm sorry, let's start. Well, this is definitely a new way of uh, visiting a museum as well. Well, we can also do some puzzles and know a little bit about collection or buildings. Uh, this, is, this one is for Jigsaw Planet. We have an example of Museu Nacional de Resistência e da Liberdade uh, in Portugal. On this site, museums can create puzzles for their audiences. In this case, there are two puzzles of the same image with a different degree of difficulty. This one with 300 pieces and one with few pieces to be done by children. A little bit easier. Other online educational activities are, of course, uh, online tours. Since the pandemic with the difficulty in being able to bring several people together, we have seen some museums conducting online visits by appointment. In this case, the Museum of Lisboa uh, continued with a regular activity adapted to their new uh, reality. It's an online tour to a new uh, exhibition and they put it on a Facebook to everybody could see. So I have a little scenario. Uh, very easy. Let's see. Well, let's imagine it's an easy one. You work at a natural history museum and you are going to create a workshop online. So it's a school break period. So children are at home with their families. Uh, it is for children from six to 10 years old. It will be about volcanoes and it is to do it yourself. Well, maybe with their parents. Of course, I have a little video in here from the Natural History Museum, and it's an example.
and we have a volcano. So with this little video, then you can share it in other social media, like in Facebook or in Instagram and in, in a lot of places. Well, at the end, we cannot ignore that we were looking forward to physically going back to museums, but digital media are here to stay. As we saw earlier, they don't replace, but are a complement to the social function and are a new way for museums to communicate and educate their audiences. The followers of museums on their social networks do not necessarily translate into visitors. They may all, only fo follow the museum on net networks, actively participate online, but not face to face. And in this way, it is possible for museums to create other communities with a different closeness, not necessarily physical, but with similar motivations that make them maintain a closeness through a social network. Now you need to see what fits better to your museum. And that certainly depends on your museum mission values, but also to your audiences, the ones you do have, and also the ones you don't have, but that you can achieve. That's the importance of knowing what's on social media, who is using what, and knowing it, you are able to choose better, where you want to be, how are you going to be, and who is your communication for, just like the beginning. Well, thank you. I hope you enjoyed. <laughs>